Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Rick Reinlisoder. I work for the King County Agriculture Program. We are, I'll, I'll use the term loosely, we're sponsoring uh, the, the Livestock and Technology Track. Um, and I am proud to, to introduce uh, Travis uh, to us this morning. Just read a little quick bit from your bio, and then you can go into a little bit more. Um, Travis, uh, also known as the American Butcher, follows in the footsteps of his great uh, grandfather, who was also a butcher. Ironically, Travis was a vegetarian for 12 years of his life. Uh, it wasn't until he volu uh, was volunteering his time in Sri Lanka, teaching children how to speak English, that he realized a large percentage of the world is vegetarian, not by choice. Uh, most dietary decisions are a Western luxury. Travis ate his first piece of meat after 12 years, when the family he was staying with saved up for over a week's worth of pay to treat him. And it was wild boar. So, um, Travis, I will turn it over to you. Good cutting enhances the quality of good meat. Poor cutting results in an inferior piece of meat, regardless of quality. Yeah. Um, so my name is Travis Doxa. Uh I have a background, well, since that experience in Sri Lanka. Uh, that was right around the time of the 2008 uh, recession. Uh, I found myself needing employment. I got an entry-level job at a slaughterhouse. Uh, my first day, I was knocking animals. I was uh, skinning. It was a complete change from what I was doing before. I'm from Southern California and I found myself like within a week living in rural Vermont killing animals. Um, <laughs> so it, it was it was unique culture shock. Uh, the person I was working for uh, paid for me to get my pass up uh, education through the University of New Hampshire. I uh, just ended up being quality control, fell myself or found myself falling into positions that uh, I just kept saying yes, I was single at the time, and uh, ended up moving back to California, managing a butcher shop, then opened up a USDA cut and wrap facility down in uh, San Diego, for, uh, got them online, uh, then was looking for to raise a family, uh, was presented with an opportunity to open up a USDA cut and uh, wrap up in like the Linden area of Washington. Uh, I ran a mobile slaughter unit up there for a while. I got um, poached by a company to do their added value uh, products. So my job title now is I'm an added value manager. Uh, so I would take whole carcasses at my work, break them down into primals, into chops. We make uh, bacon, burger, uh, smoke sausages and you can find us potentially in like 300 retailers um, and then this last year I made the Butchers of America team for to represent America in the World Butchers Challenge in 2020 which is going to be at the, uh, the Gold, Gold Coast One Arena in Sacramento. There will be 19 countries competing for who's the best butcher in the world. Um, so I'm a member of that team, Team 6, and I was bored a year ago, so I started a podcast, and we're creeping up on uh, 100 episodes. So that's just the cliff notes of my background. Um, but uh, if you, the reason I'm here mostly is because you guys are interested in farming and agriculture, and one of the biggest things that I've come across in this industry is proper communication between growers and uh, what their expectations are as final results and what is realistic. Um, like, for example, I was processing pig, or this guy came to me when I was uh, doing slaughter and he said he had an account and he was going to start doing these mangalisa pigs, which are lard, lard pigs. He wanted, had this whole charcuterie program and he had his business plan figured out before he killed his first pig and he said he wanted everything. Um, through the course of that, I ended up taking pictures of the process because when people say leave their whole fat cap on, I want them to know what that really looks like. Um, and I and I showed him afterwards. In after some reconsidering, he he didn't go through with his uh, with his hopes and expectations, which is a sad thing. But uh, hopefully, a conversation today could help prevent uh, mistakes like that happening. Uh, so. When I guess my advice, when yeah, I don't know where anyone is in their adventures in, in farming or anything, where you guys are in your path. 
But uh, what I tell new uh, people getting into it is have your market before and, and figure out what you're going to do. If you're going to end up just growing a couple of animals for yourself uh, and for friends and family, I would strongly recommend doing custom exempt. And that would mean that it's going to be essentially like a transaction between you and the person cutting your animals. And I think in the state of Washington, you could sell an animal while it's alive up to 16 parts. So if you have a beef and you find 16 buyers for that beef, then there's no reason to essentially get the federal government involved in overseeing the stamping and all that stuff. So that's... Uh, Bobby's asking just to speak up. Okay. Do you want to stand up? No. I can see it. We do not. We have plenty more room up front. Yeah. 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 There, there. You sit closer, you yes. hear better. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. There's a whole front row. Yeah. yeah. We got two seats right here, too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> One there, one here. <laughs> no, I didn't know about that. Okay. I'll, I'll project. Okay. I was in theater in high school. <laughs> Speak from the diaper. Um, so like I was saying, that with custom exempt, you, you don't need to get uh, the regulations. Uh, I would recommend going to a certified um, cut and wrap facility that follows Washington regulations on that. The libertarian side of me says that I don't really need to do that. <laughs> but that's just me. Um, if you plan on reselling it uh, to your product to like a restaurant or at a farmer's market, then you could essentially do just a cut and like a, like a health inspected kitchen if you're reselling a single ingredient item. So if you have only a restaurant client to sell like a steak or a cow or half a beef to, a, a bug, a carcass that was slaughtered under USDA could go to a uh, essentially a custom kitchen and then be broken down into that single ingredient item. Now, if you want to make sausages, you're allowed to sell that directly to the consumer. And what that would mean is selling it directly to the consumer without USDA regulation on the processing side is that it would be sold at a farmer's market. That if you were to make like sausages or if you had a CSA or something like that, those are ways to get around, not really get around, just working with the available rules right now. If you wanted to do it for resale purposes where the person you're selling to is not the final person and it's not direct transaction in a CSA or a farmer's market, then you're going to definitely have to do USDA, which is, there's a lack, I don't think that... There's a need for more USDA processing. Um, the places that are here, I know Island Growers have worked uh, closely with them. Um, Ryan O'Hearn, who is on their slaughter truck, is the co-host of my podcast. And I know Jim, and it's just that they're, they're, they're pushed to the limits. But that being said, uh, starting new slaughter ventures that I've, I've worked in the mobile side, but not in a co-op sense, but in the in trying to make it as a for-profit business, and it it's hustling. It, it's really hard work. You're chasing money. You're doing all this, and uh, you also need a to find a place that has a butcher that also has a CDL that could also communicate with farmers who also knows how to handle their cool in a situation when. Uh, harvesting animals and manipulating animals don't go so smoothly. So it seems like the overturn in that part of the industry is, I've noticed that I've, I've worked at a place where we went through like 20 people in like a two month period um, and by the time you get someone you think is good, they end up going somewhere else. And then the natural lows of the farming season were entering, it's probably we got another month and a half of and building up and building up and then right at New Year we take that lull and then during that lull you have to let people um, possibly take unemployment find stuff for them to do at, at work and then or like maintenance wise then hope that they didn't find another job during that time
just a quick one. Have you worked with somebody who's gotten their kitchen, the custom kitchen certification? Yes, I is have. Is it, how hard of a process is it? So it's, it's not that hard. Like, so I, a few years ago, lived in uh, Southern Valley, Washington, up near um, Lake Watcom. And the house I bought, the owners before, ran a taco food truck. So there was a full uh, commissary open kitchen in the basement that was already approved by the health department. So it would have just been more filing for me at that point. You have to meet the regulations as far as how many sinks you need. Uh, you're going to have, like, we had a three-bay sink, we had a product washing sink, and we had a vegetable sink. And that was just for handling raw products. And with that kitchen, I could sell like I said, straight to the consumer, and I was doing custom slaughter and processing out of there for fun, and then I personally realized it was just not how I wanted to spend my weekends. Just, yeah. <laughs> like, um, Do you think that this area is ripe for more uh, slaughterhouses or mobile slaughter or anything? Because, like, I, for instance, I have pay customers that are uh, trying to get their beef slaughtered in there they're being put off until like January. Yeah, in that, uh, I did a whole episode on a podcast about uh, how to develop that need or how to accommodate that need. And I would love nothing more to invest in a brick and mortar um, as a slaughterhouse. For me, having a place where people come and drop off animals, organizing, uh, you know, trailer pickups where people, you know, get multiple loads going at one time. And, uh, but the mobile slaughter is, is great. I, uh, and IGFC is making it work really good to fit their needs. And, but they're also overbooked. And if you had a fixed location, it would allow, uh, that drive time to not be a factor. And it also, um, yeah, help out the smaller people who only have like one or two animals to just drop off. Yeah. So I, I want to introduce one of my colleagues, Patrice Barentine, to if you want to speak briefly to the project we're working on, Patrice. Sure. In King County, we are working on bringing a USDA mobile slaughter unit um, to Carnation Farms, and it would be a fixed one. It would not be traveling okay. to farms. We would operate from there. Um, in Washington State has more USDA mobile units than anywhere else in the nation, so you should just know that you know the first one was IGFC. Um, so we've always been cutting edge. But it's hard to work with that, and I'm hearing you say that access for custom for USDA, they're both really low, and we would need as an industry to work together to make sure that we've got succession plans for uh, current butchers to make sure that we're not losing people. And that's why it's so exciting to have somebody like Travis here to say, I'm into this, I'm oh. doing a good job, and I'm, and I'm creating efficiency so that it can work long term. Yeah, and like... Yeah, the, talking about the efficiencies, I look at every aspect of like processing of how to make this easy, how to make it profitable, how to make it so the communication between the farmer <coughs> and the, who's going to get the product at the end is happy and it's all streamlined. Because um, working in cut and wrap facilities, I'll, someone will drop off an animal and they'll, they have an idea of like, okay, well, this is all in your packet. And they'll just say like, I want something like this. But names change regionally. Uh, expectations of fat design change regionally, re regionally. and then bone in versus uh, bone list is usually like a twenty five percent markup. And then uh, uh, grinding or making sausages. When I get a cut sheet where someone's like, "All right, here's one pig, and I want five pounds of this, I want five pounds of this." Uh, as yeah, sweet Italian, five pounds as a bratwurst. You're dealing with a spice blend that is designed to only uh, be like one bag is 25 pounds. The most industrial grinders hold about uh, two pounds of just waste in their throat that they can't push out. So like you, uh, you could end up getting that out by reworking and putting old grind back in there. Then you end up with smear and maceration and all that stuff. Uh, but one of my big things is just having that open communication and I, in, in giving the realistic expectations when uh, someone says, I want a cut sheet that, like for a chuck, I want the Denver's, I want a seven blade, well you can't have both. It's the same as like, <laughs> I want, um, 
I want a porter house and my tenderloin. Well, you could you can't get your whole tenderloin, but you could get like the Chateau Brion and the sirloin portion. And you know, working with that with the butchers and uh, like my yeah, it, 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 it's when people are like, could you break uh, here's like five cut sheets for like one half or something like that. And so those are the things that end up taking time and costing costing money and costing money and labor. And so in like streamlining, it's uh, uh, that by just being like, all right, this is what he says he wants. And then we give it exactly, but he ends up selling it to a chef who had a completely different vision. So just knowing the terminology and even having your butcher communicate with the chef or having someone who knows the terminology communicate with the chef. Is there a cheat sheet for that? Because we've been in that situation where, you know, you want pork belly, but you can't have bacon or, you know, different things. And, like, it's it's hard to plan your whole butcher if you're, you know, new in it. Yeah. How do you get, like, in... Uh, the intel to make the right decisions or what's the best way to go about doing it if you're you want to be able to talk intelligently about it but then not take all your butcher's time mm-hmm. yeah so bacon and pork belly you know uh you have a pig i would just divide it in half and then have two cut sheets one per half and that genuinely wouldn't be it it, it should be fine with most. And that's what I did. Yeah. But, like, there's lots of other innuendos. Yeah. So, so like, uh, for example, if I were to get, like, a side of pork and someone wanted bone-in pork chops and boneless pork chops, I would take the the sirloin uh, portion or the short loin portion of the pork, make that into my boneless, make the bone in in the rib section, have a pulled, pulled tenderloin, turn the sirloin butterfly it, season it, and that would possibly be a porchetta or a small roast unseasoned, or that could be added in the trim. Uh, pork is a... Oh, sorry. No, that's <laughs> it. So I, I think you're saying I'm just like going, yum, it's like, how do I know that? I mean, like, uh, that's awesome. And, and pork is one of those things where it's it's an animal with a beautiful yield where you could end up like breaking down an animal and just end up with a handful of glands of just like unusable stuff. Uh, that being said, it's also very hard to sell beef lard. It's also very hard to sell back fat. So, and uh, you end up throwing all that stuff away, uh, or the cutters do. Uh, it's like trying to get the um, leaf lard out of it. Like, mm-hmm. you know, when you, they're just giving you all the fat, like they didn't yeah. go harvest just the... Yeah, so I would just... Uh, as far as that, uh, so like something I would say if you bring it to whoever you bring it to, you say, I want my leaf lard, uh, loosen it up here in the slaughter point, and then they pull it up to the kidney and it hangs loose. Um, and then when it dries, it's one hard big piece. And then they'll, they could cut it up with a knife and then package it like that. And it has a very uh, different texture than back fat. Back fat is, is, is hard. You could cure a solid piece of like back fat as like a, uh, Lardo and then leaf lard is something that's soft that you could whip and emulsify and make into an added value product such as like whipped lardo or you can make those sweet and savory as well. Going back and listening to this while I'm editing it, I realized I didn't really answer her question. She was asking, is there a source? And I'd recommend um, starting with the nap guide because the terminology is broad enough that any butcher shop And any chef should be able to access that information. And that's what she was really asking. Um, And then I just went on a self-indulgent tangent. So the NAP guide, the North American Meats Buyer Guide, and they update that yearly. And for example, like someone says, I want a ribeye. I want this. I want that. You'd be like, oh, what do you want? A 109D, a 109A. Do you want this or that? And then it's just a point of reference where you could say, if you're really frustrated, um, you could just type in the nap guide number identification on a cut sheet. So, yeah. I have a question about your podcast. Yes. Is it, who's your target audience? Is it consumers? Is it farmers? Or is it both? Or is it butchers? I mean, is it so and, the, and why? I mean, you said why you got into it. How yeah. is it financed? Uh, oh, it's, it's financed by me. Okay. <laughs> there, there, there's, there's no. You don't have advertisers. No, no. At least it, not yet. Yeah, I, I think I'm personally sponsored. They sponsor just the American team. Um, but the podcast, I always say, it's a podcast by butchers for everyone. Um, my, it's just an honest conversation. I have 
no problems talking about mistakes, misnocks. I have no problems talking about just like how brutal uh, Thanksgiving is and how big of a nightmare. I don't color. I don't. Uh, I don't sugarcoat language. I just have a real conversation. We interview a lot of farmers, a lot of growers. Uh, I have two uh, co-hosts. Uh, <laughs> David, a good friend of mine, he is now the processing manager down in uh, California running their uh, slaughter floor, but he's also a sheep farmer. So he'll talk about harvesting and he'll talk about yields, and he's a great source for the podcast to bridge, because he's on both sides of it. And then uh, my other host, uh, Ryan, works for uh, IGFC on their mobile truck. I had a question was, how were you able to build such a strong network that people got you on podcasts and you were able to have such a large uh, Uh, consumer kind of network? um, That's a great question. And honestly, when I was uh, working in Slaughterhouse, I just, I I was on Instagram. I started an Instagram uh, called The American Butcher. And I started taking pictures of just what I saw every single day. And the idea of what is obvious to you is amazing to others. Like something I'd see every day is just like someone skimming out an animal and people don't see that every day. So I started taking pictures of it. So uh, I just, my notes are just single words. So I'm trying to decide from I wrote uh, <laughs> yield on there and I saw that Linda earlier this week posted, I think from Penn State, the, the yield um, the yield study they did with the title that butchers aren't stealing your meat. And, and that, that's the biggest, uh, not the biggest thing, but I know every time I have, uh, I've gotten a call in the past from a farmer who's not looking to uh, not looking to reschedule because they don't, um, they're not grasping. They they like I brought you an animal that weighed, I brought you a pig because it's just the easiest. I brought you a pig that weighs like 240 pounds. All right, market size hogs usually hang around 200 pounds, depending on a cut sheet. If people like, there's a standard fat cap that people leave uh, or the rind and if you end up cutting you know just that basically and it's not notated that like i want every single thing or leave this much fat cap on there genuinely they're not going to give you that stuff it's going to end up like when you're cutting you have a barrel right here you cut your fat you just put it right in that rendering barrel it goes to uh, a rendering facility that turns it into uh cosmetics, dog food pellets, and fertilizer. So it is still being sustainable and still being reused and repurposed, but the end result sometimes is people being unhappy with their yield because they ended up bringing a, um, they ended up not specifying that they wanted, them wanting their fat cap and not understanding the percentage loss and how much actual lean muscle comes from a hundred or 240 pound pig or 250 pound pig. Yeah, so it's going to be 70% on a skinned out hog. And skinned out hogs usually don't come with the heads on. If you have access uh, to a processor with a scalder, your uh, yield's going to go up. And yeah, things that people have a hard time selling to improve improve your margin and your waste is, uh, if you find an outlet for it, is usually heads. Uh, you know, I process 20 hogs for added value product a week. And I sell probably two heads a month. Mm-hmm. So uh, the rest go into rendering. Uh, we harvest the cheese, we harvest the head meat, and that goes into emulsified products. So what was the seventy percent from hanging weight to the retail weight, or and, live weight to the hanging? Uh, live weight to the hanging weight. Yeah. And then from that, it, it mm-hmm. to, to get it from your what would be your hot weight, and your hot weight is also going to. From the day you slaughter it, from like the next day, it can lose up to ten percent, j- just because of someone would be like, "Oh, the hot weight was this, and I wanted every single cut and got this back." Uh, you're going to end up with moisture loss because it's put into essentially a blast cooler, and the colder something is, the drier it is. Um, so, it, it and if people want, a lot of times I hear people wanting whole carcasses aged for about three weeks. This is beef that no one really just for intentionally. Um, so, uh, so people who want whole beef aged, it's going to be possibly up to a 15% loss from moisture just from, um, being in the, the cooler that whole time. 
Um, and then also you're going to end up with a bigger loss because you got to take all that bark off of it. Because that bark is is full of bacteria, even though it's uh, penicillin based bacteria. It's not like the end of the world, but people don't want to eat it. It's not really that healthy, uh, wholesome. I wouldn't eat it. Um, and then I always hear people saying, could you hang my carcass for two weeks? Or could you hang it for this? Uh, genuinely, 21 days is the point where actually something happens. 21 days is when proteins become denuded. After that, you're not going to get it any more tender. You're changing the flavor profile, just like a cheese. You're bringing out uh, dry aged meat and cheese has the most uh, naturally occurring MSG than like I think any other food group. So it can be addictive. Do you normally recommend it at a certain age of, I mean, a certain amount of uh, aging? Do you like to go to 21 or do you prefer? Uh, so the company I work for now, we do, uh, on our beef, we harvest all cuts uh, besides the, the drop loin, which is from the sirloin, uh, including the tenderloin and the short loin. And we put that on a rack and we forget about it for four weeks. And then we do the same with the ribeyes and we make them into whole tomahawk sections. Mm -hmm. And then we just uh, dry age the entire ribeye. Someone may want the tomahawk, they may not. We could easily cut the bones off. But if you've seen online right now, that's the big thing that's selling is these big macho pieces of meat and people <laughs> sprinkling salt on them and <laughs> all this stuff. Um, but I personally, I, I like dry age. Uh, beef. I think it, um, what dry aging does is it bring, since you're losing moisture content, you're not tasting water, you're tasting actually what the animal may have been eating. You're tasting, so it really changed, you could tell the difference between a uh, grain fed versus a grass fed in the in the texture and in the fat and how it hits, hits your palate. Um, also, that just reminded me, if you ever want to know uh, if an animal is grass fed or not, uh, you could usually see the fat is a little bit uh, more yellow to orange just because of the tannins in it or the keratins in it. Any other questions? One of the strict restraints of the aging process, though, is the size of the facility and the throughput. Yes, absolutely. And we, uh, it's, yeah. you know, 14 days minimum. Mm -hmm. Very rarely can you get to that seventh, you know, the 21 days because of through the necessity of the cooling facilities. Unless yeah. You, unless you potentially pay for it. Exactly. If because, you're... because it's real estate. It, yeah. it, it's, it, you pay that cheap. yeah. And that is actually something I'm, uh, going, me and my boss at my work are talking about expanding our cooler because we have the, the space to do it. And we're just trying to crunch the numbers to see if it economically makes sense. Essentially make like how they used to have like old game walkers where it would just be like you bring it a USDA product and we, it just, it's an aging cooler. Um, and then also with aging, you want in your community about like 80% in your cooler and you want airflow. You start seeing stuff that looks fuzzy. You take a little bit of apple cider vinegar, just dab that little fuzzy spot, it'll clear up and you'll get bark right back on it. So, um, but, um, I'm going to ask, how difficult is it for you to like meet the needs of your consumers, and how far would you go to do so? Um, how difficult it, it's, it's difficult. I've had difficulties in the past because I've worked for a lot of like small businesses that are for profit. And when you have that mentality, you may not do things streamlined. You may want to just do it to keep the customer happy and keep them coming back. And now in my career where, where I work, I'm not, I'm not chasing that as much. Um, things are, are put into place. So like we have repeat customers, our products and, and expanding and things like that. Um, but it, it, for any small business, it, it's hard to say no, but what, once saying yes costs you money. And that's where it, you know, like working for cutting wraps, it's like, I need to cut sheet by this day. I need to cut because everyone has a schedule. And the worst thing is like trying to call someone up and being like, Hey, I have your uh, beef on the rail. We're going to cut it next and we don't have a cut sheet. I would recommend having a cut sheet filled out when you drop off your animal. And, uh, you know, 
work in a timely fashion to pick up that as well. Uh, in like accommodations, like saying, uh, yes, I'll stay late because some people can't get to certain places until they get off work. But those, uh, but those people also need to recognize that those people are also at their work and they can't go home. And, you know, so it's just, I don't know. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> Yes. Um, this is just my kind of question, but like, what are kind of the consequences of like not butchering like properly? Like, it's just like bad butchering and like not like a really clean facility. So, cleanliness in like a USDA standard could result in a recall. It could result in being out of compliance. Uh, so, there's HACCP, which is hazard analysis, critical control points, and uh, it's where the system and that's put in place to ensure that you're meeting the federal guidelines to selling to the public. So you have traceabilities on all ends, you have temperature monitoring on all and if you're working slaughter you have zero tolerance on all end. So having say something that could damage that is uh, mostly paperwork being filled out incorrectly doesn't necessarily mean the facility is unkempt but if someone didn't do a pre-shipment review that could result in a recall. If uh, if there was a allergen cleanup that was missed, that's huge. That that that's a recall. And <laughs> like if it's a recall where you can't get a lot of product back, it could devastate small businesses. Um, and then as far as like just cleanliness, we uh, facilities do random testing by the USDA where they're swabbing, and then uh, places I work also do. Um, in-house testing to meet with uh, regulations where once a month we'll hold a product, send it to a lab, they'll test for listeria, they'll test for salmonella uh, on cooked products, on stuff that's ready to eat, and then on raw products they'll uh, check for salmonella and E. coli. Um, and we, we follow that within the guidelines of the USDA. They don't do it, we do it by their saying. So it, there are big consequences. It, with not butchering properly, besides just <laughs> making people unhappy with what they get, uh, you know, for uh, the the darker side is you. So not butchering properly could mean that they don't know how to knock. They're not properly trained, and you end up with animals with sensibility when they should be. Re re and that is it. It happens. We've all seen those slowing down videos. Sarah McLaughlin planes, you know, <laughs> but like some of it's out of context, but some of it is like the egregious stuff. It, it those people deservingly could go to jail for, um, and every NR or non-compliance report filed by the USCA is public information. And if I were to have a miss knock, even though I don't work in slaughter, so this is hypothetical, um, and the USDA shuts me down, and they're going to shut you down until you have a revision on your uh, humane handling program, where that may be a third party comes out and retrains you. That could be where it's like, oh, an animal slipped, let's cut some grooves in your floor. Um, it, or it could be as simple as like humane handling shutdown, could, uh, NR could be like that animal didn't have access to water. So you just put a bucket of water up. So when places get in, in, inhumane handling NRs, it's one important because like, uh, uh, abusing an animal and uh, not giving it access to water are completely different. And then it's all that's why it's important to train and to just know, know those consequences. Because if you were to Google certain people's name, it comes up on non compliances. And when you Google it and it comes up, does it give the reason for the non compliance? Or does it just you, you no can, water or inhumane? They're it, both treated the same. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's a full report in there, but like I worked out a place and an animal slipped. Uh, it was mobile slaughter. That animal wasn't even being slaughtered. It was just on the farm and the animal slipped uh, and it was right in front of a vet. And it was like, we got an NR and it's like, cool. <laughs> and you know, like, and then a couple of weeks later, we got a phone call from an animal rights activist uh, yelling all kinds of obscenities because they read this thing, not realizing one that animal wasn't up for slaughter. Well, that, 
you know, and uh, yeah, so it's a double edged sword. People should should trust the systems in place, and people should uh, treat animals well. Is the bottom line, I guess. And, and like Miss Knox, I you're allowed a a, percent, a failure rate, I believe, but like it used to be one out of every 1,500, but it's non-consecutive, so it doesn't carry over to the next day. So most places don't do 1,500 animals in a day. So if you mess up one of those, then you're shut down. Um, but the USDA wants to know how you're going to react in in that, in that spot. Like you have an animal in a headlock or a head restraint, and it's moving like this, and you miss knock, and you just go, oh, no, like th- that it's going to be worse versus if you – have a backup, you calmly pick up your backup, you line up your site, and you just take care of business. Um, you know, and the USDA at that point, it because it, they're people, and they understand that people make mistakes, and they may just very well be like, hey, take it easy, let's figure out what happened, or they could just write you up. So, I don't know. Just stuff like that. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah. What made you like the train in the first place? Um. Yeah, like. It, <laughs> well, well, I, I always tell people that, like, I, yeah, I just needed work, so I just showed up and, uh, like, it was weird machismo. Like my first day, I killed animals, and then like everyone like had these blood vials and they're like you gotta drink the blood and like all this and I was like okay and I did and no one else did <laughs> so like uh, um, but it's just it, it was just a job until I uh, realized that I was that I had like an act for it and that like and then when I realized like I couldn't do anything else if I like if I lost my job I'd be like I wouldn't know what to do well I get another job but like <laughs> if all of a sudden it's like butchery just like didn't exist anymore i i don't know um it it was a job before it became a career once it became a career it became a passion and then now i just devote everything i can into promoting the craft and having just a better understanding and like my whole thing is i just want to be honest and just like uh, i'm not ashamed of anything i do <laughs> Why do you work? Oh, you do. Okay, so yeah. you're burning then. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Um, do you find um, I uh, am a cattle rancher. Okay. And uh, um, and uh, I work with Ryan. Okay. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah, I scudget River Ranch. Anyway, um, do you find it is really difficult to find um, butcher? Yes. So. I mean, I think that's most of the problem. We can have the mobile slaughter unit. We have like two or three of them that yeah. kind of didn't work out, and. Uh, um, and it's great that Carnation Farm is doing that, uh, but eventually it's going to be the people. Yeah. Try to find yeah. the butcher that are capable, like you. I mean, how do you, do you have any idea how to develop? Do you have any, any kind of educational program you can think about? Yeah, so with the, with the World Butchers Challenge, our goal is to develop like a, um, a nation, a, um, a worldwide standard of butchery that will allow for butchers to travel and you know essentially do like a um like a foreign exchange program where we could have butchers from other countries come and work in small shops here and etc so we could uh not lose some of the the small craft things that are just only regional i guess ryan himself i knew him through instagram he had his uh instagram account gather and break and he used to work in uh, like Michigan, Illinois, and um, and I became friends with him online, and he asked me just like after uh, online that he wanted a job. I sent him a list of uh, with IGFC, um, Linden Meats. Uh, I think it was it Cascade Foods at the time, my job, and there may have been a custom shop on there. Uh, all of <laughs> the talk about the scarcity, all of those places offered him a job. Um, 
so he he went with including my place um, and then he ended up going with IGFC because it's the pet yeah. <laughs> <laughs> further on that though there's a difference we love Ryan to death yeah. but there's a difference between the cut shop in mm-hmm. the house yeah. and that truck Oh yeah. It takes a very one out of ten, a very unique breed of person mm. that manages that trailer. Yeah. Even even in the custom world, the truck that goes out, you know, you have to be very motivated. That's the hard thing talking with the Scott Willis's of the of the world, all mm. the custom butchers. Um, that's where they're having the hard time is that in internship availability of getting people in the field. It's not yeah. some, it is an issue in the cut room, but the uh, scarcity of the trucks. You get guys, because it's the hardest job there is. You get guys in their 45, 50 years old. They're, they're broken down. Yeah. They, can't, they can't continue at the pace. You know, and one of the issues is, you know, you got the Savannah's, the custom shops. They still have enough throughput. Mm-hmm. We don't have enough field guys. Yeah. And then the hard thing, the beautiful thing about what you're doing is great, but then the, the, the very need for our custom butchers is... The backbone of, you know, not even from the Homish County is you've got the people that are the backyard that got the three, four animals mm-hmm. and may do one or two a year. They have absolutely no handling facilities. Yeah. They don't know. They don't have any loading facilities. They don't have a trailer. Mm-hmm. So there's where your custom exempt butcher is in a huge need. Yeah. And that we've got to protect. I mean, the, the host sites. For the mobile solder unit, it's great, but you have to have all that other infrastructure in place yeah. for that small small farmer to be able to get their product, their animal to a facility. Yeah. And to... to because under the USDA with the mobile solder units, you still have to have a handling, handling facility and a means to yeah, mainly yeah. knock the animals. And, and a lot of our small ranchers, farmers with the two or three animals out back, they don't have any of that infrastructure. Yeah, uh, I work for Burke Ridge, running their uh, slaughter unit, uh, and then that was the company I worked for before. And every time we would um, take on a a new a new client, we'd go over there and we had a checklist: potable water. Do you have holding pins? Do you have an isolation pin? Do you have a way to restrain the animal? Um, and it was: uh, Do you have a place where drainage could be? properly maintain where you don't end up with a big pile? Do you have a place where you can knock the animal where it either falls on concrete or dry uh, dry grass or a place that's not going to be all muddy and make you... And it, a lot of it's intuitive and seems to make sense and you can check it all off and you get there and then it's not. It's completely different. Um, Is that where you think that there's a huge need for educating producers? Really small producers? Yeah, and what I would recommend for really small producers who have is if you only have those three animals, personally don't don't go USDA. Yeah, right. Go, yeah, right. You go go custom uh, because someone pays me a couple hundred bucks. I'll go out to someone's farm, shoot their animals, throw them in the back of my truck, take them to my house, and process them for them. That's like it, that. That would be the easiest. Uh, I, I would say. But you want those people to have a, a still a clean, humane area yeah. to do that part. And yeah. most people don't think about that when they're like, I'm going to raise my own meat. Yeah, so what in when people, when they raise their own... So the difference between custom and USDA is there's no HACCP in custom. Uh, they have to follow the same food safety guidelines uh, from the state, but they don't have to follow the HACCP portion of it. They don't, the documentation is missing. But then you start getting into the aspect of custom, like you see custom guys who just, they don't bung stuff, they don't uh, wheeze, wheeze animals, uh, that's where you close the throat up so they don't vomit all over themselves. Um, and when, and instead of trimming and taking the time, they're in the business of making money, they just have a hose and they just rinse it all off. Um, and I don't have a, a, a solution to correct that because it's before usually old school and stuff in their ways. I know when I do custom, I prefer to have a, a clean area, but I also don't do custom anymore because I found it more difficult. And slaughter is truly a, I've always said it, slaughter is a young person's game. Uh, 
when I worked slaughter, I was in my early 20s and we were processing like 45 head of beef a day and uh, 120 lambs and like like 180 pigs, like on those certain days. And then like, uh, we also did 1,500 chickens with sucks. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but like, I think it took me at that pace, it took me less than a month to get carpal tunnel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and now I have tendonitis and a slew of other problems. So it's just, it, it is, it, it's, it's hard work. You're lifting, you have repetitive motions and you have overwork injuries and you have a lot of people who are dealing with the aspect of being outside and, in uh, in, in the outside in Washington, which is genuinely sometimes not that nice. So, uh, if you are doing those couple animals, just make it the most comfortable that you can, uh, I've, I've slaughtered where I've just been like, do you have a driveway and I could just hose your driveway down at, at the end of it or uh, have your animals closest to access to the vehicle so people aren't dragging them across an entire field. Or like I uh, did a job where a guy's like, all right, my sheep are right here and it's in like a 15 by 15 pen and I'm like, they didn't want to be near me. <laughs> so and taking long shots is not fun. So um, kind of back to the USDA versus testing thing. Um, mm-hmm. uh, for instance, I, I'm a hay grower, not a livestock guy. So um, I have a lot of customers, though, that are trying to sell their one or two cows to try mm-hmm. to, like, pay for their family's half of beef today. Mm-hmm. And they all tell me they have to go through this USDA um, stuff to sell their uh, meat. Is there a good way to... You know, tell them. Yeah, so go. have the transaction while the animal's alive, because it's not uh, because at that point you you could sell it up to sixteen parts while the animal's alive, right. and keep the the federal government out of it. I guess mm-hmm. you know, but you still want to go to a reputable uh, cut shop, and I I don't know personally about the custom exempt shops around here. I haven't worked in them, so I, I can't Key say. Keyword is alive. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the keyword is very is very much alive. And a way to do that, honestly, is you set aside one animal and you just take deposits. And then say, like, you give me a hundred dollar deposit that ensures that when I meet so many people, like the demand or, or whatever. <laughs> and then to make it the most less complicated for the butcher and the farmer is hat is to push a standard cut sheet in a situation like that. That you you are going to get this many steaks, you're going to get this many pounds of ground beef because you start getting into people like, well, I want this, I want that, I want that. And you could just imagine 16 different people wanting 16 different things. And then a guy who is trying to uh, manage that. Yeah. yeah. It, it, and that's where the mistakes happen. And that's where people be like, he stole my meat. And it's right. like, no, the guy's just not a computer, made a mistake. <laughs> 80% of these people don't have a clue what they're doing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's be real. I mean, two yeah. cows whimsically at an option or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the, they um, is there a good online source that I can like direct them? Like, here, go here, because this will tell you exactly what you need to do. Yeah. You know? It sounds like there's a podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my, my podcast, yeah. And then uh, there's. Yeah. Also, easy just to call the Department of Agriculture because they license all the custom slaughter places yeah. and they can want. The folks through yeah. it could be thirty. It could be divided into thirty-two sections. Oh, okay. In Washington. Awesome. So, <laughs> which would be crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's easy yeah. so just have to call the department, and yeah. and that's an easy walk through. For I find it being running into it more and more. It's like you know, you get these people that just show up off the street. Cole, you could actually also send them to their county. You know, cattlemen's group. Right. Yeah, yeah. cattlemen's. I've sent some to cattlemen's. Yeah. Oh. And then also for the smaller smaller people too, because we're talking about this blackout or the scheduling of butchering is when you do the USDA side of slaughter, you really you really learn a lot, and it's not for everybody. You, and like you mentioned, it's really you just don't want to stay get into it if you're small, one or two, three out, because it's a retail nightmare. The money to be made is on the rail, and you're just getting rid of that animal. Mm-hmm. On the rail, which means you you've sold it live, 
and then you're harvesting it, somebody's cutting, wrapping it, and somebody's picking it up, and it goes away. But the other thing I think um, a lot of people have to think about is the hardest time to slaughter your animals, typically, because it's been like that for decades, is fall. Yeah. Okay, so now you're getting the phone calls to the, the custom slaughters that we've all dealt with, where years ago it was three weeks' notice, now you're not going to get a slaughter date if you called today till February, March of next year. So you're feeding that animal through the winter again. Mm-hmm. And so, like when you're doing, when you're trying to do consistently in the USDA retail world, well, you can't slaughter once a year because now you're selling that product by the cut or whatever to the individuals. And so you've got to rethink and almost do a year-round slaughter. And so I, I, I'm trying to, with a lot of our cattlemen members, is you've got to rethink your animals and try to pre-plan a slaughter and maybe start pushing that up a month or two and knowing your product so that you aren't hitting that rush time because the more you put feed into that animal, of course, you're losing the money that you're trying to generate. And that was my focus on farming uh, breakout session that I held. Um, It was great. It was a great conversation that was taught at the end. My digital recorder actually stopped recording at that moment and uh which is unfortunate because i ended up talking and people ended up talking for about another uh 30 minutes and it was awesome hopefully i get to do it again next year and i just want to say big thanks to linda newtson uh for coordinating it and everyone involved in that room uh you know i'm terrible with numbers uh with how many people are in there so i would like to just to umbrella uh thank the 1500 people there um who were in that session yeah it, it, i know it's very popular and if you enjoyed that and you would like me to come to an event and ramble or me to come and possibly break down an animal at an event and talk about meat related things or just talk about like i don't know fishing or hardcore bands from the mid nineties. I could ramble about many other topics. Milo. I could talk about Milo for a while. He's white with some mocha running through him with some random darker hairs and some dark pattering on his face. I could talk about other labradoodles. Talk about fishing. Man, I love fishing. Wish it, wish I was uh, good at it. Um, hit me up at American Butcher on Instagram or you can email me meatblockpodcast at gmail.com and yeah I hope you enjoyed this episode it was fun I had a great time at that event Um, and I hope I get, get to do it again next year and if you're looking for a way to support the show honestly the best way to do that is open up the podcast app of your choosing rate and review us and please please leave a comment i love reading the comments if you have a uh, a question for an upcoming q a how about you leave it in the comment sections that'd be pretty cool also check out the gofundme for butchers of america team 